Good evening. I'm Greg Friedman, founder and CEO of Private Ocean. And uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We're actually doing a Private Ocean first. Pretty exciting on this virtual world. Uh, this is Sea Change. And it's actually a live cooking demonstration. For those of you who know me, I'm a tremendous foodie. And I hear the laughter. I know you're, you're laughing. But we have our special guest speaker and chef, Jennifer Bushman. Uh, Jennifer, as I am, uh, is also a fellow board member of the Marine Mammal Center. So we're very much involved in that. She's one of the fish and seafood industry's most respected communicators, teachers, and sustainability strategists, which is a lot of S's. Uh, for more than two decades, Jennifer has worked in sustainable aquaculture, which aquaculture, uh, we're gonna do a session on that someday because I'm fascinated by that. And she has taught thousands through her culinary school, nothing to it. She's been recognized numerous times by the James Beard Foundation and the International Association of Culinary Professionals. And obviously we're very excited to have you, Jennifer, and uh, see what you're cooking up for us today. Uh, this is an experiment, so we know this is gonna work. It's gonna be great. Uh, we also invite questions. So through the chat, uh, feel free to ask questions during. Um, we'll try to, bring them during uh, as we can, or certainly at the end. So welcome, Jennifer. We're excited to see what you cook up for us. Yeah, we are very excited. Um, we have a wonderful recipe tonight for a seafood paella, and I'm, I'm really excited to get started. This wonderful and delicious recipe. And you know, the foundation of a paella, for example, is one of these things that we have that's steeped in our history. You know, I feel like every single country of the world, whether it's a pesto or a chimichurri, you know, we have these common threads in all of our cooking and paella is one of them. I mean, I think that these baked rice dishes that you see in South America, that you see throughout Europe, up, they all really have something in common. That rich, beautiful tomato, the delicious onions, the sauteed peppers, and of course, seafood. So one of the things that I want to talk to you about is kind of frame this up, because when you think about the heritage of fish and seafood throughout Spain and Portugal, this is one of the most sustainable fisheries in the world, and one of the leaders actually in aquaculture. So all throughout this demonstration, I'm going to talk to you about how we kind of source our fish and seafood, where it comes from. And as Greg said, I want to encourage you to ask questions because this really only works if it's interactive, if it's this give and take as I'm making it, any type of question is, is welcome. And of course, the dish is going to ultimately end up delicious. So it'd be great later on if you send your photos and we get to see everything that you've made as well. So most paellas, and you even see this with um, even in Louisiana cooking, you know, we begin with essentially what's called a mirepoix. And a mirepoix is that delicious sauteed onions and peppers. In French cuisine, they add carrots to it. So that's really where I'm going to begin. And I want to show you a couple of things because how we prepare our vegetables in a dish is really super important. You know, one of the things we think about is just sort of the tools of the trade. And when it comes to our mirepoix, we want to make sure we have a really sharp knife. I'm going to just sort of show you how to begin by prepping the onion, which, you know, what's so funny is everyone always says to me, you're kidding. You're actually going to teach me how to chop an onion. But the reason why I'm going to do it is because when you take your knife and you kind of chop, chop, chop over something, you bring out the juices in it. And the more juices I bring out in the onion, the more oniony the paella is ultimately going to be. So let me show you something. We're going to start off first by cutting the onion in half. And you'll see that I'm leaving the stem and the top intact. And then what I'm going to do is actually peel the onion back, just literally peeling away the layers. And what you'll see I'm going to end up with is a handle. Do you see how I can kind of hold on to that? I'm going to do it with the other one too. So what we're going to do is just peel back the layers of those onions, of that onion, and we're going to leave the back end intact with that handle. And the reason why we do this is because we're actually going to chop it. We're not going to cry because when we chop it properly, we don't end up in tears. And so I'm going to show you now what we do. 
you'll see the onion has all of these lines in it, that natural grain of the onion. So the first thing that I'm going to do is take my knife and I'm gonna cut along those layers of the onion, those lines that are naturally there. Now, if you can imagine, if I want my onion really finely chopped, you can see how I've set those lines really close together. If I want it, say, a little bit more coarsely chopped, then what I do is I actually skip and you can see how it's gonna make a broader chop. Now, when I, the next step of this is actually to very carefully take my hand and cut across the onion. Now you see, I'm still not cutting through that little edge that I've left as my handle. And now when I chop the onion, you can see that without chopping over it, without crying, without getting all of those juices, I end up with a beautiful chopped onion itself. So enough about the onion for now. I wanna to talk to you about some of the other ingredients that I have here. You know, one of the things that is so gorgeous about Spanish cuisine is saffron. And so I wanna tell you a little bit about the saffron because you know, there's a reason why when you go into the grocery store, you buy saffron, you'll get a little tiny box of it and it'll end up being, I don't know, 10, 12, $15. And part of the reason why is because what saffron is, is the threads or the stamen, that interior of the purple crocus flower. And every single one of these has to be hand-picked and then, and then obviously dried. So it's a very labor-intensive process. And when you find saffron that isn't expensive, a lot of times it'll be kind of a different species or a different hybrid of it that's from, um, that's from Africa. So it won't have that kind of floral, delicious aroma that really is gonna make the paella the flavorful piece of it. So what I've done is I've actually taken this and most of the time in recipes, you'll wanna steep in hot water this, these beautiful little saffron um, little threads. And you can see what I'm gonna do is end up adding that to the pan. And then the next thing that I have is some smoked paprika. And I feel like this is like the energy of the dish because it's gonna bring out this kind of smoky, beautiful, almost it enriches the flavor of the tomato to have that wonderful uh, flavor with it in there. I also have some peppers and I have some freshly chopped garlic and I can't express this enough. It did come from a head of garlic, cutting it off and taking that clove and then actually freshly chopping it. And this is really important in your cooking. There are two things that are really important. Grinding your own pepper, cracking that fresh pepper and chopping your own garlic. And the reason why is because garlic and things like pepper have the ability to raise sweetness levels in a dish and lower the bitterness levels. So when we start to cook this down, it really brings out the sweetness of the pepper and of the actual onion itself. So right here is what we call mise en place, the French will say. Um, it means everything in its place. So when you make the paella, you don't wanna be running back over to the cutting board, chopping everything up and then running back to the pan. We wanna have everything ready to go. And then I also have my seafood. Now, to start off with, this is actually, we're actually going to use some fresh seafood. And then at the end of the dish, we're gonna add some tinned seafood. So I wanna to talk to you about this really quickly. First and foremost, whenever you cook with fish and seafood, you wanna make sure it's very cold. So what I did was I prepped this off I covered it with a damp paper towel and I kept it in the refrigerator. And the reason why is that fish sticks to pans when it's coming to room temperature. So like if your fish sticks on the grill, it's because it's not cold enough. So the fish has to be cold and the pan has to be hot. So we wanna make sure, first of all, to start off, I'm gonna season this. And what I have is a little bit of halibut. Of course, our halibut is coming from Alaska wild halibut, 
The Alaskan fishery is a sustainably managed fishery, and it's actually rated by the Marine Stewardship Council. So whenever you think about buying fish and seafood that's either wild or farmed, there are two things to look for. One is the Marine Stewardship Council blue fish. It's, got a, it's a little blue fish on the label. I'll show it to you on the tin seafood. And on the farm side, we want to look for things from, that are certified from the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. That's going to tell you that it is done, either reared or harvested in the very, very best way. And I'll tell you why this is important. One of the things Greg and I talk a lot about is fish and seafood and how if we don't leave enough in our oceans, our marine mammals will not have enough to eat. And frankly, neither will you. 90% of the oceans are fished out or fished to capacity. There are 4.6 million boats in the water right now that are commercially fishing our fish and seafood, and the majority of which is not sustainable. So whenever I look for fish and seafood, like this halibut, I look for that Marine Stewardship Council label, and I know that I'm getting the best. If you're not sure, the other thing you can do is use the Seafood Watch app. That app that you download on your phone, all you have to do is put in the species and where it's from, and it'll tell you if it's sustainable by a red light, a yellow light, or a green light. Red pretty much means you never, ever want to eat it. Whether farmed or wild, it's bad. It means it's not sustainable for the environment. Jennifer. Yellow means that maybe it's a fishery that we're watching, that we're improving, and we can go ahead and source it from there. But we have to be careful. And Jennifer. green means we can eat it all day long. So the halibut, most Alaskan fisheries are well-managed. And this is a beautiful pink shrimp that's coming from Mexico. This is a Del Pacifico pink shrimp that is actually also fair trade certified, which means that the shrimp is coming not only from a sustainable fishery in Mexico, in the Pacific, but also that the people, the fishers, and the community are getting an equitable wage. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take all of this over to the stove. And I have a couple of things in process already. So the first thing is I want to start to get my pans nice and hot. I already have actually some fish, fish stock. And this is very important to a paella that we have a fish stock or a broth. So you can see I've got that in there and it's nice and hot. And I'll explain why that's important in a minute. But you've got, as we've talked about, you've got all of these things pretty much ready to go. So the fish stock is salt-free and it's hot. And the reason why it's salt-free is because as I'm adding it to the rice for the paella, remember that liquid evaporates off, but salt stays. So the more liquid that evaporates off of my paella, the saltier it'll get if I use any broth that has salt in it. And this rule of thumb is pretty much the same for any broth that you would actually use. So now, here's what I'm going to do. I've already started some of that mirepoix because I wanted it to be slowly cooked and I wanted it to get nice and sweet. So what I've done, and you can already see I'm getting a little bit of natural color on this, is I've taken a Spanish olive oil and I've just started to cook this down at about medium heat. And I can't tell you how important this is. If you cook it at high heat, it'll burn really quickly and that won't bring out sweetness. So the natural fond, as we call it, that caramelization that's on that is actually exactly what we're looking for. We don't want it to happen quickly or it'll just taste like it's burnt and probably a little bit bitter. Now, this paella is probably a little bit different than what you would expect. Because what I do is I actually cook the seafood separately. I want to get it a little bit brown, get it cooked through. And I'm not a huge fan of how paella's fish and seafood kind of steams in it. So I make sure to get my pan nice and hot. And remember what I said to you is we want to, we want to get the pan nice and hot. And when we do, the oil is really going to bead in it. It's not going to smoke necessarily, but you can see how it already starts to bead in the pan. And then I will lightly season this fish and seafood. So I'm gonna put a little bit of pepper over it. And this is the next piece that's really important. 
we want to make sure that we put it in a single layer in the pan to cook it. And the reason why is because otherwise we'll lose the juices in the fish and seafood and it'll actually start to steam. So you can see how quickly it's gonna cook up. Now, if the fish is sticking, sometimes you know you go to turn it, it'll stick. That's because the pan's not hot enough. So what we do is it'll cook very quickly. We're just gonna turn it as soon as it starts to brown. And you can see in a hot pan how quickly, within just a couple of minutes, the fish and seafood will start to cook. The same would be true even with our halibut, and I'll show you. I'll make sure that we put it just a couple of pieces in, and then we'll watch. And when it gets nice and browned, it'll just automatically lift off of the pan. So we're gonna move this to the back burner, and we're gonna move forward our vegetables. So you'll, you'll forgive me because we're kind of swapping things out as we go to make sure we get all of this in for you. So we're gonna make sure that that pan is at about medium. And I've got a couple of things I wanna show you now. Now, paella rice is really special rice. And you may not know this, but it actually has kind of a larger, what they call endosperm in it. So if you've ever looked at rice and you see like a white kind of kernel inside the rice, it's the endosperm that really gives it its flavor and, and actually its texture. So I wanna show you this because if we look here, and I'm hoping you can see, there are all of these white flecks on those grains of rice. And that actually is the endosperm. And what that means is, and I'll explain it here, what it means is that when I make a risotto, for example, that the process of a creamy risotto coming together is actually the kernels, the grains of rice rubbing up against one another. So you know, you always hear about, make sure that you stir and stir and stir your risotto. Well, it's those grains of rice rubbing up against one another as you stir it that makes the risotto creamy. In the case of paella, we want it to almost be al dente or firm to the tooth so we don't stir it. And you can use a paella rice or you can use this bamba rice, which also is a really beautiful rice that's used in Spain for paella. And you can see the, the brand Matisse España you can find this actually at a number of places in the grocery store, or if any of the things that we're using today, the, um, the tinned seafood, the beautiful tomatoes, these you can also find at Caputo's, caputos.com, which is this beautiful um, deli and market that's actually in Salt Lake City. And I love getting uh, my, uh, my fish, my seafood, chocolates, olive oils, all kinds of things from them. So now we have, to, we have to really get some great flavors in this pan. So one of the things that we're going to do is add our smoked paprika to the pan. And you know, this is very similar to when we're making, let's say a mole, where we wanna bring out all of the smells, the spices, all of these great flavors that warm up when we put them in the pan. So we don't wanna burn it. We don't wanna to get too much of that robust kind of warm flavor, but just enough so that we can really begin to smell it. And that's what we're getting is this great smokiness and you can see the color that we're adding. And then the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add my tomatoes. And this is one of those where it is actually very important the types of tomatoes that you pick. And you're going to see whether it's Italian beautiful jarred tomatoes, or if it was a Spanish tomato, it's very important to use these rich tomatoes that are actually from the area that we're cooking from. There's nothing like a, an Italian tomato. And you may not know this, but it's the Italian tomatoes that are so sweet and less acidic. There's a reason why when you're traveling in Italy and you just can't get enough of the tomatoes, it's because there's this rich flavor and the acid is quite a bit lower than American tomatoes generally. So I always make sure to get those great crushed Italian tomatoes for my dishes. And you can see that we've just, just allowed this to come up to temperature. And then I'm gonna add my saffron threads and that beautiful kind of 
it's almost like this steeped saffron that's gonna go into this. And then the next thing is, I'm gonna get my, my broth here. Now you'll see the broth is nice and warm. And what I wanna do is just take about, oh, a cup of the broth and add it into this beautiful kind of broth mixture with the tomatoes. And then we're gonna sprinkle over the paella rice. And this really is not going to be touched at this point. Once we've sprinkled it over, now we're just going to leave it and allow it to cook for about 15 minutes on low. What we're gonna do now actually is move on over. We'll let this simmer because as I said to you, we're gonna have all of these swap outs and we kind of have to because otherwise we can't get this whole thing done. And what I wanna do then now is talk to you about the flavor components that are gonna be in this dish and the things that I personally like to add. We talked a little bit about fish and seafood and the importance of really knowing where your food comes from. And in the case of our oceans, this is a really important thing. You know, the seas that are around Spain, they give you such a plethora of delicious different types of fish and seafood, from sardines to anchovies, that beautiful branzino, all kinds of fish and seafood. So paellas were not originally specifically one type of fish or seafood. They really were kind of this amalgamation, this, this melting pot of whatever happened to be around. But what you might not know is that the Spanish and the Portuguese were really the ones to create the art of tinned seafood. And when I say this to you, it really is something that is so amazing to me because when you travel to these regions in Portugal, to Lisbon and others, these port towns, what you're going to see is these fishers that go out and fish, come back with their catch and then process these beautiful fish and seafood in a processing plant and then by hand actually cook and tin them. This is a company called Jose's, and I don't know if you all can see this, but every single one of their labels is actually, it actually is an artist that's from the University of Portugal that does the labels themselves. So every single different type of fish and seafood has these beautiful artisanal labels. This one actually, this, these are so beautiful. These are mackerel. And I wanna show you this because I cannot imagine in my life having the patience to hand pack these tins of fish and seafood. But look at this. Do you see how it's packed in Spanish olive oil? I wanna show you another one that's the mussels. And do you see how every single one of them are like beautifully placed into the tin themselves? And there's a trick to this, which I had no idea about. We have to actually cook the fish in the tin without the lid on. So really good tinned or what they call conservus. Conservus is this, this sort of art of the tin seafood is that they cook it with the lid off so that all of the steam can escape. Less expensive tinned seafood, even that canned tuna that you get, is actually steaming inside of a can that is closed. So I think that the, the, the style of it, the artisanal part of it has really been lost because of the fact that we don't have that very specific method or that art to being able to cook it. Now, one of the other things that I want you to see is this one actually is done in this chili kind of an oil. And there are others from, um, like sometimes I can find the mackerel and it's done in a little tomato sauce. In this case, this mackerel, and you can see these little tiny fish. Can you believe this? Little tiny fish that has the bones removed that we can actually use in our paella. And this is what I like to do with this. And it is a little bit unusual for sure, is I like to take these tin seafoods and add them to the paella at the end. And you may think of canned 
deficiency food as being really strong in flavor. Maybe you're thinking of your cat food, but actually it's very sweet and very flavorful. And just that little drizzle of the oil or the sauce over your paella really gives it a beautiful flavor. I wanna show you though um, this box. And the reason why is because this is that Marine Stewardship Council check that is the bluefish check. And the reason why I want you to recognize that, along with, um, in this case, even on the back, and this, this Sea Tales is a new line that just came out, and Bart is the founder, and he actually gives the story of the fishery on the back of the box. We know exactly where it's coming from. There's a QR code that traces it back to the fisher and where it was processed. And then of course, you know, we have things like, and I don't know, really know why to be honest, but that it's actually verified by the non-GMO project. Um, most of the time, these only have olive oil or a little bit of sauce and seafood. So I think that one's maybe, be, maybe a little bit super, superfluous, but whatever. The main thing is to recognize that check there that blue fish from the Marine Stewardship Council. And so whether it's anchovies, whether it's sardines, these end up being really important components to our tinned fish and seafood because most tinned fish and seafood isn't marked with anything, just like these Spanish ones. And unless you know well the purveyor, you're not going to know if this is something that's been harvested or reared in the right way. And, you know, to Greg's point, yes, aquaculture is important. As a matter of fact, 64% of our fish and seafood in the U.S. is farmed. But trust me, not all sustainably farmed. And there are great farmers now that are rearing the oysters you love, um, rearing abalone off of the co coast of Monterey, seaweeds and, and sea kelps, and even salmon that all are now being done sustainably. So something that's really super important is to look for that farmer, look for the provenance, and support both farmed and wild fish and seafood. Really important. So now let's take a look here. We have our paella all done. You can see how beautifully it turned out. The, the rice itself, do you see how it's actually plumped up and gotten very tender? I've taken pieces of my, of my halibut and of the, of the um, shrimp and put it in there. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna add, because this is for Daryl, my husband and I, who are Daryl's filming today for us, but I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take the mussels and tuck some of those into our paella. And then I'm also going to take a few little slices of that mackerel and I'm going to sprinkle it over as well. Now, the, there are components to things that can go with our paella that I think are really delicious. A couple of things to look for that I got from Caputo's actually. One is a little vinegar, really bright, little bit of a hot sauce that's from Spain that's actually specifically for paella. The other thing that you'll see, I like to garnish my paella with a little bit of parsley. And then I've got some of these, this is actually a little Matisse piquillo pepper. And if you wanted, I made a little aioli and it sounds really fancy, but it's not. The aioli is actually something that um, I just made with a little bit of mayonnaise and lime juice and a little bit of our leftover tomato sauce. So if someone wanted this to be just a little bit richer, we could use it and just kind of drizzle it over the paella. So this is one of those things. I like to serve it right in the pan, um, serve it alongside. I've got some olives here, some Marcona almonds, some little marinated white beans, all really delicious, beautiful things that um, are going to turn out, give us all of the like great flavors of Spain. Along with a little Rioja, we have a little bit of wine to go with it, something that's rich and beautiful. And I mean, I, Greg, I don't know about you, but I don't think that we can go wrong. Oh yeah, so um, obviously very popular. So there are some questions. Are you Great. ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am I'm ready. Okay. I've got the wine and I'm ready <laughs> okay. to go. All right. So why does fish at room temperature stick more? 
because the proteins are so tender. So if you think about it, the proteins in fish and seafood are very delicate and tender. So they tend to get a little bit mushy and they stick much faster than say a steak would. So where a steak or chicken or pork would always be cooked at room temperature, because by the time the inside gets done on a steak or chicken or pork, the outside is overdone. So we always bring those up to room temperature by taking them out of the, the refrigerator for about an hour before you would want to cook them, depending on the size of the, the meat itself, the portions. But in the case of fish and seafood, if it gets a little bit soggy or a little bit softer, it'll immediately stick to the grill or the pan. Excellent. Okay. Um, this next question, a lot of people, uh, this is a very common question I've heard out in the world. Is there a nutritional difference between farm and wild seafood? And it's actually something I've always wondered about. So. Yeah, you know, it, uh, so it's very interesting because there's been a lot of debate about that, that we think that farm salmon doesn't have the omega-3s that wild does. Again, when we're talking about sustainable, ethical aquaculture, there are feed models now that actually will give that fish more algae, more um, ingredients that will give it more omega-3s, and it doesn't have the dioxins, the, the, the toxins in it that we get now from wild seafood because those PCBs that are in the water, in the oceans, those are things that the wild fish are eating. We can take that out and make sure it's not in our, in our feeds for, for example, for any carnivorous fish we're raising. That's probably the single biggest misnomer that I've heard because essentially for many years, the, the claim or the, I guess the expectation, the thought was that farm raised was unhealthy. They're all packed in, they're not well taken care yeah. of, blah, blah, blah. So this is really- Well, and I think, I think it's super important to remember, we're not talking about commodity aquaculture. You're not walking in um, and, and buying a fish or seafood that you don't know where it came from. You've got to be really active consumers. Yeah. And, you know, and I say there's, there's all, there has been for many, many years, this consumptive entitlement to our oceans. We think we just, it's the last wild frontier that we should just be able to go out there and grab whatever we want. And somehow with that 4.6 million boats, somehow yeah. those little fishies are going to grow fast enough to keep up with our appetite. And yeah. it's just not possible any longer. So I look at it this way. When was the last time that you asked at a restaurant or when you bought it, if your ribeye was wild caught? Well, Probably not, right? We're not exactly. going out there in wild and, and shooting the cows out um, in the wild. So exactly. we have to learn that that's also how we have to revere and treat our oceans. Excellent. And and great water farmers do are doing that. Well, and there's technology and apps now that help you do that. So that's right. Um, okay, is there seafood you would not recommend using in, in your dishes? In a paella? Yeah. Or just in general? Uh, well, <laughs> they don't mention it, but I'm guessing a paella. Yeah, I mean, I no, I don't think there is anything that you couldn't use. I suppose that like a petrolli sole or something that was a little bit more delicate. Of course, I skipped the part about cooking it all together. You know, traditional paellas, you put all the seafood in, you, you let it kind of simmer along once the rice is done, and you might end up with something that is a little bit overdone or that could break apart. So I wouldn't use particularly delicate fish um, per se, but um, I certainly can tell you that there are fish and seafood out there that I wouldn't eat at all in the wild, you know, bluefin tuna being one of them. Um, I probably wouldn't use um, any sort of, I probably could use an albacore in this, which is very sustainable, but, um, but I'd be really careful to make sure that I wasn't getting anything that was, that was in the red zone. Sure. Okay. Um... I thought sausage, I don't think this, but somebody, I thought sausage was always an ingredient in paella. Is it true? Yeah, and we have it in this recipe, um, but some people want that, some people don't. And so in the recipe, I actually saute it individually, just as I did the fish and seafood, and then I add it in the end. So it's really just up to you again, uh, if you'd like sausage in it or not, but it is in the recipe for tonight. Okay. All righty, so they're still coming. Uh, when do you Good. add the chorizo? 
<laughs> so in my recipe, we added it actually in the pan after we were sauteing the fish and seafood. And then I would put it in and place it back in after I was ready to serve, you know, as I was ready to serve it. And that for me is be is for one reason, because I love getting that fond that caramelization on the sausages, on the fish and on the, um, and on the shrimp. It, there's something about, the way I put it, Greg, is this. You know, if I gave you a bowl of white sugar and you took a bite, it wouldn't taste very good. You know, we've all like put sugar in our mouth. It's kind of grainy, it's not super sweet. You know, if you try to put it in a cup of iced tea, it wouldn't even dissolve, right? Yeah. If I take the sugar and I warm it a little bit, just a little bit, kind of like when we steam something or we poach it, then what happens is that's water and sugar makes a little sugar syrup and it's sweeter, right? Yeah. But there's nothing like cooking that sugar to a caramel sauce. And so, you know, my feeling is, do you want a craft caramel sauce or do you want a dove, bar, dove caramel sauce? You know, where it's really golden and I call it GB and D golden brown and delicious. So to me, it's that caramelization, that golden brown color that really adds a layer of flavor to the paella. So I do it with the, if I put chorizo in it, I slice it, brown it up, and then put all of that deliciousness into the pan. Excellent. Um, and when do you add the cooked fish? So I added everything at the end. So everything. for me, I add it back in as soon as the rice is finished cooking. And then that way, and I've done this in my cookbooks and a number of things where I'll make a broth, a soup, I'll steam all of the vegetables or roast them individually and then pour the warm broth over them so that everything has the perfect texture and it has all of the perfect flavors all together. So I was not the only one channeling Julia Child. And uh, someone asked, Julia Child recommended cooking paella in a wok. What do you think? Oh, I think that's great. I think any, any, like for example, mine, the one that we used today was a Le Creuset, heavy cast iron skillet that's really going to conduct the heat. And the reason why she liked the wok or the why we like a paella pan is because of how it conducts the heat. Because your pans aren't very good if you're getting burning in the center just where the stove is, right? Right where that burner is hitting good pans will conduct heat across the bottom of the pan and all the way up the sides. And so for a paella, that's exactly what we're looking for. But there are a lot of pans that you can use for it. Mainly you wanna just make sure it's a good heavy pan that you've preheated. Cool. Um, yeah. Where can we buy Fishtails products? Ah, so I, you know, this is gonna be a really good question because this is, so Sea Tails, um, Bart just came out with them and I'm pretty sure we can get them from Caputo's. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about BASA? B-A-S-A? -A? I don't know what it is. I don't either. I don't either. Well, I'm so sorry. Uh, you stumped well, me. I'm gonna, Tracy, I'm going to suggest you, you follow up with me and I'll connect you with Jennifer and you guys can talk about that. We'll chat about that. Absolutely. Um, are there regulations that forces fishmongers to know the correct provenance of the seafood they are selling besides a very general geographical area? No. So the only thing that's required by law in the United States is that on the, uh, at the fish case, they have to say the species and the country of origin. So no, there is not. Um, obviously, there are exceptions to any rule. So for example, if where you live, and I've had friends who live along Lake Michigan, and there's beautiful perch there, part of that fishery is rated red. But if you know the fisher and you trust the way he's fishing, maybe he's hand line catching that fish, then I would buy from that fisher. There are nuances to these rules. And we certainly have had fisheries that have turned out red where there were elements of that artisanal fishery that we knew was being managed sustainably. So what I would say is there's not a one size fits all. It's really important to know your local fish and seafood if you can, but then when you're buying from places like your local fishmonger, you've got to ask questions. And the most important question to ask is, where is this from? Where did this fish come from? And use the app, because if you know where the fish came from, then on the Seafood Watch app, 
there are scientists, marine biologists, and oceanographers that are working around the clock to rate these fisheries. And the reports are extensive. They're usually over 100, 120 pages. They're pre-peer and peer reviewed. So they're looking at the entire ecosystem. They're looking at whether or not there's fair labor involved. They're looking and making sure that there's not slavery involved. A lot of people don't know that fish and seafood has the most slavery than any other industry in the world. So, so we um, put people on boats in the high seas and they're in indentured servitude or slavery forever. So we have to really like lean on the information that we get from our fishmonger. I can tell you that if you're not sure, buy fish from Whole Foods because Whole Foods standards, their certifications are actually higher and exceed Marine Stewardship Council, ASC and Seafood Watch. Great, okay, good. Um, ever put olives in the dish? Why not? I've got olives here. We've got some beautiful olives to add to it. I love their brininess. Um, I think this is probably a preference, but I, my husband will tell you, I love acid. I love brininess. I love what it brings out in a dish. So whether it's some sun-dried tomatoes, some marinated tomatoes and vinegar, a little dash of a little sherry vinegar, I, I think it does so much for a paella. <laughs> That's great. Um, our friend John Warner, should we avoid fish oil supplements, animal food with fish, et cetera? Um, great question. Uh, yeah, that is a great question. I would say yes, because for the very reason that when you take a supplement, you don't, your body actually doesn't absorb it in the same way as when you eat it naturally. So the FDA recommendation is that you need three to four portions of seafood, fish and seafood, those rich oily fish every single week to get the long chain omega-3s that you need in your diet. And this is that superpower. You know, omega-3s are a superpower. They help you fight off all this craziness that's happening in the world right now. They help your brain development. They lower the rate of heart disease. Just, just have more oily, beautiful fish. Eat it that way. Get your omega-3s that way. And then you don't burp up that terrible flavor either. Cool. Um, I think here's, here's another question that I, I think a lot of people are wondering. When you're at the fish counter and the fish is all laid out, how do you know if it has the check? Now, is uh, this, I is this, Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah, so sometimes the check will be on the fish and seafood counter case, the signage. Um, and if it's not, then I will ask them to show me the box. Because uh, most fishers, distributors, they want it on there. But a lot of grocery stores, even Whole Foods, and remember, Whole Foods, no matter what is in there, I mean, I've worked with the director of sustainability. They put a lot of thought and intention behind it. But the box will tell you a lot. So the farmers I work with, they put the ASC logo and everything on the side of the box. Sure. Okay. Um, where can we get information on the color categories you referred to? Yeah, you're uh, right. So go to go to seafoodwatch.org and it will give you all of the information. Um, and you can do that on your computer or you can download the app on the app store. Great. Um, how do you handle the sofrito part? Ah, uh, well, I mean, obviously I I'm I'm such a fan and I add it to the hot pan and make sure that it's sauteing and it's really cooking up. Bless you. <laughs> um, uh, when you get that, depending on how you make the sofrito, the most important thing is like when we were toasting that smoked paprika, that you really get it nice and hot and then incorporate it into those liquids and then add, um, and then add the paella rice. Excellent. Um, by the way, someone pointed out Basa is a farmed fish similar to tilapia. So I Oh, well. In addition knew. to learning a lot about what Thank you're talking you. about. Okay. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to look that one up. I should yeah. know that. I appreciate that. Um, and then someone asked uh, one cup, well, they said they saw one cup of stock go into the cooked ingredients. Where did the rest go? Yeah, it's gonna keep going in. So I've got my liquid from my tomatoes. I've got the that quarter cup of the liquid that came from the saffron. And then I'm gonna just, as that boils down, I'm gonna keep adding the fish stock to it because it's gonna cook off. And you're going to want to make sure to keep it nice and moist while the rice is cooking. If you let it all cook off at that point, then the rice would still be crunchy. You would lose the liquid before the rice had cooked through. So keep the broth nice and warm. And then like risotto, you keep adding it sort of as a, a ladle at a time as it cooks down. 
Excellent. Um, do you have a source for fresh seaweed? Ah. <laughs> uh. Well, I do. Besides walking out the door and, you know. Yeah, I know, right, and plucking it. So there are two, I'm so excited to be able to talk about this. So one is Barnacle Foods. They actually have fresh bull kelp that's coming out of Alaska with other phenomenal ingredients. And then the other one I like is Ocean Tides, which is actually coming seaweed coming from Maine. And they do fresh, but they also do dried, and they do a puree which I use now for things like um, my pestos and things. So I'm trying to actually incorporate more seaweed and sea kelp in my everyday cooking by using some of these unique ingredients. So good for you. Good in iodine, super, super nutraceutical. That's, well, that's awesome. Um, someone's yeah. asking a question and probably not lost. Uh, I, I'm sure other people have this question too. Uh, uh, obviously Amazon bought Whole Foods and I think that, right healthy sense of you know is that still gonna so basically the question is are the the whole foods standards still good yes <laughs> i mean they yes didn't. absolutely you know what whole I, foods, I whole foods didn't yes. change them did they no it hasn't and uh and there's a lot of hard-working people that are making sure that those standards are still high so uh, at least in my fishy space i can tell you that we work directly with them, the farmers I work with, and those standards just keep getting better and better and better. And the fish and seafood that you see there um, and that whole food certification is not an easy mark to get. And, and it is one of those that um, keeps improving. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to wrap up. I want to say that if for people, if they want more information, they can absolutely reach out to us. I can connect you with Great. Jennifer. She's more than happy as you, as you can see, she doesn't lack passion about this topic or these topics. Um, yes. I really want to thank you, Jennifer. Uh, great demonstration, great information. Uh, love your passion. Really enjoy working with you on the board of Marine Mammal Center. Uh, Such an honor. I Greg. love what we're doing there. Um, and just thank you all for attending. And I hope you have a great and safe evening. Thank you again. Cheers, everybody. Good night. Good night.